This is a webinar on learning menus, series appetizers, background information. I'm your presenter, Kelly Stair. I'm the author of VoiceThread for Digital Education um, and QR Revolution, which is available on pre-order from Smashwords. Um, my website is angrybunnypublishing.com, so if you want to see more of my webinars, you're welcome to go there. And then my email address is here. First, what's a learning menu? Learning menus are differentiation strategies. Um, a learning menu offers a menu of student choices for learning activities. Each choice um, offers different points or different types or levels of tasks with that menu option. Um, for learning menus for units, we're going to divide them into sections. So we've got our beverages, our appetizers, our entree, and those are different types of learning activities. And students choose which options they want to do from each section. And so there's a lot of choice and self-differentiation going on by students. Um, the options are the tasks or activities that students complete in order to earn that set of points. So we are constructing unit-based learning menus. Uh, we started with um, beverages, which was vocabulary. And now we are working on appetizers, which is the activating and leveling background information. For more webinars, you can go to angrybunnypublishing.com. Uh, the events page shows upcoming webinars. And the recent blogs or the online workshop will get you to the archived webinars with the screencasts in the PowerPoints. The unit menu template that we are working with um, has five different types of activities. You've got your beverages. That's your vocabulary study. Appetizers is your background information. That's what we'll be working on today. Your soup and salad is the supplementary texts with the tasks that go with that. And those are focusing on literacy strategies. Um, your entree is your anchor text and all the tasks that go along with that. And that's your digging deep into themes and essential questions and um, working through that complex text. And then finally, your dessert is the summative assessment that students will do to show what they've learned. We'll start with some appetizers. Um, background information for me is one of the most important places to differentiate. Students come into a classroom with so many different levels of knowledge. They know some things but don't know others. There's cultural background knowledge. Um, there's language background knowledge. There's all kinds of ideas that students have about the world that are different from each other. And so one of the most overlooked pieces is activating and leveling background information for students. If you're going to be talking about something that students don't know a lot about, it is essential that you create a layer of underlying schema for them to start adding information to and building on. If you don't have that base, there's nothing for them to build. And so they might get it for a second, but they'll never hold on to it. So if you want kids to really hold on to information and knowledge, you've got to create background information, and you've got to make sure that that's tied to what they already know. Um, for background information, it's important to offer many types of information, but especially videos. Um, the last statistic I saw was 84%, but this is the one that I could prove. Um, over 70% of the population are visual learners. And that means that 70% of people in America, and that's all people, um, it gets higher and higher the younger you go. We learn by seeing things, by seeing things that are happening. Um, we watch TV, we see uh, websites, we have commercials. All of these activate our visual um, knowledge, and that helps us um, make information concrete and makes it apply to us. Um, so when you're trying to level or activate background information for students, it's important that the resources that you use are visual resources. So the tasks that you use with those visual resources, they're just basic comprehension and completion tasks. Um, it is not important for the leveling of background information that students are assessed on every single thing. This is more of a let's build up your knowledge so that when we get to the literacy strategies and we get to the big ideas, you will have enough of a foundation that you can do those tasks. And so a lot of the tasks that you do in this section um, will be basic, did you get it, did you do it, participation. The guiding questions that I use when I'm trying to figure out what I should do for my background um, knowledge, 
for students, um, these are my guiding questions. First off, what do my students need to know to understand the theme, the topic, or the anchor text, whatever it is that we're working on? And so if we are reading a book about a different country, then we need to get into all the cultural differences, um, all of the country's differences, language differences. We need to get into the things that they might not get. Um, if we're reading about a different time in history, there's going to be a lot of differences between what they know to be true and what was true in a different point in time. Um, social, economic, geographical differences, technological differences. I remember once I was reading a short story with kids um, and somebody got a, a phone cord wrapped around their arm as they're talking on their phone and the kids are like, what are you talking about? What? Why would a phone have a cord? And I'm like, whoa. Um, so there are just cultural differences with um, things even in the same country um, with different points in time. So that's really important. And then where might they get confused? Um, what could be completely unfamiliar? And more importantly, what might be just a little bit different, but in a way that's really confusing? Um, I remember another time I was reading with my students, and it was a piece of British literature, and someone was saying they went on the lift. And finally a kid was just, and he said it like three times, and he was like, what is a lift? And I'm like, oh no, it's an elevator. And they're like, oh. And so it was just that one little piece of information that it wasn't that different, and yet they just could not grasp what was going on. So you've got all of these different things um, that students can get confused about that aren't part of the main idea. It's the background stuff that they need to know in order to do whatever the main idea is. So it's really important that we fix those issues before they have to start reading and get really frustrated. So I've been talking about two different things to do with background knowledge. Um, activating and leveling. Um, activating background knowledge helps students identify and connect what they already know. Students come to us with lots and lots of knowledge, but they don't always apply it to different contexts well. And so what we can do is we can help them activate what they already know and show them that they know these things, they understand these things, it's not that big of a leap to get where we want them to go. And the second thing is leveling knowledge. Some students will not have the background knowledge that they need um, in one or more areas in order to be successful with whatever unit it is you're studying. So you want to level the knowledge. You want to make sure that everybody has access to the base knowledge um, in order to be successful in the unit. You can use videos, articles, compilations, um, but they should be high interest, they need to be short, they need to be focused, and most importantly they need to offer regular opportunities for students to react and respond. That's how they're processing the information. Showing it to our documentary is not a good way to activate or level background knowledge because it doesn't offer kids a chance to process. And so short, focused activities that give opportunities to react and respond and process information are important when we're leveling background knowledge. Here's some types of activities that you can use in the appetizer list of your menu. You can do individual activities. Um, where just a single person is working with information or text or um, an idea. You can do small group activities where you have two or more in a smaller group working together and you get that collaboration. Um, or you can do large group activities where you have the whole class or a big part of the class working all together. Um, also with collaboration, but a little bit more diverse. Um, even individual activities can have feedback. And feedback is really important for processing. So when kids are processing information, they need to have some feedback so that they know that they're processing it correctly. Um, types of activities, we've got written activities, discussion activities, reading and viewing activities, and visualizing activities. Um, remember how many kids are visual learners? Um, well over 80%. And so they need to be able to visualize. So they create... Um, images, they create graphic organizers, they create um, ways to visualize the information um, and connect it to other things. You've also got activation and leveling activities. So some activities are better to activate knowledge, um, like uh, posting a quote on the board and having kids journal about it. Um, that is not a good activity for kids that don't have that knowledge. They're not going to be able to journal about things that they don't know about. Um, so different, different things for different activation or leveling. 
and then using texts. Some activities for um, background knowledge do not involve text. If I, for example, we were going to read a book that was about identity, um, I could have students brainstorm um, in a group about what it means to have an identity. What are pieces of your identity? That doesn't involve a text. Um, but other things might involve a text. So if I want to have um, students read a book, um, A Long Way Gone by Ishmael Bale, all about Sierra Leone and child soldiers, if they don't have that background information, I want to give them that information. And so when you're using text to activate background knowledge, visuals are the best. Use images, use videos, use infographics, or compilations of those where students can um, see them, view them, and then respond and react. You also have processing or guided processing activities. If the background information that students need is very complex, you might have a guided reading activity that goes along with it. So maybe you have an article that really gets into it, but you don't want students to just cold read an article. And so you have some guiding questions on the side. You've highlighted the vocabulary that you think they don't know, and you've created a guided activity for students to process that information. Finally, you can also have open-ended um, activities. That's questions for them to think about, or to share, or to discuss, or to debate. Um, reflections, like, what do you think about this? Um, well, now what do you think about it? Um, and then offering them pieces of information and then having them change their minds. You can also have inquiry activities where students do some outside research or find some of their own texts. So here are some examples of um, activities for activating or leveling background knowledge with technology tools that will help students do this. Um, you can have discussions in class. I find that class discussions are some of the best ways not only for kids to activate and level their background knowledge because as they share things then other kids learn them, um, but also for me to know exactly what they know and where they might have some issues with background knowledge. Um, and so discussions are great, especially bigger class-based discussions. Um, a back channel is uh, when you use technology in order to create a secondary discussion. You have your main discussion that's oral verbal, um, but then you also have a discussion that's going on online. Um, and today's Meet is a great back channel tool. Um, basically, it's kind of like a Twitter feed um, where students can input their 140 character comments, um, but it doesn't require any sign up. So they don't have to have a Twitter account. They don't have to have a Today's Meet account. All they have to do is um, go to the website, put their name, and then write their response. And so having a discussion with Today's Meet as a back channel is a great way to um, foster that idea that, yes, you have a main discussion going on, and that's where the bulk of the teacher's focus is. But then you also have this back channel where if you have a comment that you want to make, you can put it up there. You don't want to say it out loud in class, but you want to put it up there. Um, you have a discussion with another person, but you don't want to interrupt the main discussion, you can put it up there. And so back channel discussions are great for leveling background information. Students can also do journals or journal any kind of writing assignment. Um, with a response group, and I always use blogs for these. Um, the great thing about blogs is, number one, kids can do them on their cell phones, and so they don't have to remember a notebook. They've got their cell phone in their pocket, pull it out, get on your blog, um, text it in. You can also do it with response groups, and there you're not passing people's journals around. Um, you just give them the URL, and once kids get the URL, then they can go on and they can make comments, and they can do it all at once. They can do it the... Um, at their leisure, you know, if they, they miss, it, miss somebody's, they can go home and do it. And so everybody gets that kind of response. Also, if you have kids that are absent, journal writing with a blog is great because then um, their response group can respond to what they've written, even if they weren't there to write it in class that day. Another thing that you can do to activate or level background knowledge is to take a poll. Students love taking polls. Um, they love to have their opinions out there, and Poll Everywhere is a great tool that you can use um, to have these interactive polls. So students can use their cell phones or a computer um, or any browser, and they can um, answer poll questions, multiple choice questions or open-ended questions, 
and the responses are tallied immediately. And so if a student texts in their response for a multiple choice poll, for example, um, their response will show up on the board. And so um, the, the little tally bar will go across as their, as their text goes in. It's really cool to see students go, oh my gosh, that's my answer, mine just went up. Um, and they get all excited about it. And so it creates a lot of energy um, taking polls in class. Another thing that you can do is use graphic organizers for that visualization. Um, and Exploratory is a great site for uh, graphic organizers. You can have students um, pull information um, individually. You can have them work in small groups and make a graphic organizer that way. Um, they can use web resources to find information. And so using Exploratory is a great way to get that graphic organizers in there. Collaborative brainstorming is a fantastic way for students to really get together and find out exactly what they know and what everybody in their group knows. Um, Twiddle is a great site for um, collaborative brainstorming. It's um, a whiteboard application where you don't need a login. You just open up a Twiddle account um, or a Twiddle page and then invite people in through a URL. And then everybody on the page can write on it or um, add, you can add shapes and all kinds of fun stuff. You can also add websites to it, and you can create separate pages with different websites, and then you can draw on those websites. So if you find information, you can upload it to your Twiddly, you can circle it, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, it's a free account just to be on it, but if you wanted to actually save things, um, you would have to pay for an account. Um, I never pay for it. I just have kids do a screenshot if I need to see what they've been working on, and it's an easy way to, to get around that. Another thing that students can do to activate and level background information is to do a gallery walk with discussion forums. And for that, I'd use QR codes. So a gallery walk, um, I'll give you a basic example. Let's say students uh, watch a, a short video in class that you have up on the screen. Um, they watch the video and they pull one piece of information that they thought was valuable from that video. And then they explain why that piece of information was important or why it was interesting or what it made them think of or what connections or whatever. Um, then you would have uh, big pieces of paper on the wall and you can have students go to different groups and say, okay, if you thought this, you can go here. Um, if you have, you know, what was this interesting thing? This is good with bigger pieces of information. Um, and so maybe you have three or four different pieces of paper hanging up on the walls and everybody grabs their resource and puts something interesting up on that piece of paper for each one. Okay. Then, if you want to use a QR code, you can create a discussion forum online. Um, and there are a lot of discussion forum um, software applications that you can use for free. And you can have students scan a QR code and get directly to that discussion forum. And then, in addition to adding their piece of information, they can also discuss it with other people on the forum. Uh, the last one is compilation reading or viewing. And um, I've got two sources for that one, plus the third source, which I'll actually give you the example of on the next slide. Um, Storify is a great resource for finding up-to-date information um, through Facebook, through Twitter, through um, websites and media sites. It is a social media source. And so you can find all of these different things that people are saying about a topic and you can put them into your own little story. Scoop It is similar. Um, it's focused a little bit more on websites as opposed to social media sites. Um, and so it can be a little bit more academic, um, although sometimes not as up to date. And if you have a topic that is in uh, the current news cycle, you would definitely want to do some with Storify. But Scoop It is fantastic for resources uh, that are a little bit more uh, permanent on the web. One more resource for compilations, and that's several different types of text all put together that you want students to work with, is VoiceThread. And VoiceThread is a fantastic um, web tool uh, for creating discussions in the cloud. Um, I have an example VoiceThread, and I'm going to pull this up. Um, Oh, I have it pulled up, and I'm going to share um, on my screen. So hold on just a second. 
I'm going to screen share for you. Okay, it's going to take just a second to screen share. Okay, so now you're seeing what's on my screen. Uh, here is a voice thread. Um, I did this as an activation activity for when my freshman students read A Long Way Gone by Ishmael Bale, which I said is about um, child soldiers in Sierra Leone. Now, my kids don't know anything about child soldiers. They don't know anything about Sierra Leone or what it's like to live in a country like Sierra Leone. And the best way to get them that information is to show them some great visuals. So I use VoiceThread. Um, each VoiceThread has a slide. Uh, that slide can be an image like this. Um, it can be a video, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you can use lots of different media for your slides. And then you make a comment down here. Um, you can sign in and you can make your own comments. You can make your comments by typing them in by recording them on your microphone or by videotaping them. And so my comment here is, welcome to the introduction voice thread. Um, it says you're going to make some personal connections and thoughts about each media piece. Okay, so nothing too tricky. It's just participation. I want them to see it, view it, and make some connections and responses. Um, so this one is a picture of a child soldier. And we talked about the word juxtapose and how it means setting things up for contrast. So we talk about the juxtaposition between a child and a soldier in this image, and then students would comment on that. This one is a video. I'm actually going to pause it so it doesn't record, or so it doesn't play. Um, this one is a news story about a man who has been on the run for 10 years. His family is gone. Um, he is all alone, and the soldiers in Sierra Leone are hunting him down. And so he has been on the run for 10 years. He has no home. Um, he has no safety. And so it, it kind of goes into what his journey has been like. And so students will comment on that. This is an interview with the author, Ishmael Bale, who was a child soldier for years before he went into, or before he was rescued and uh, rehabilitated. Uh, this is a PowerPoint um, about child soldiers in Sierra Leone and kind of some of the historical background that students might not be aware of in the blood diamond industry. This is a really interesting video about people in Sierra Leone watching, sorry, watching a documentary about the war in Sierra Leone. And so it's after the war was over and they're watching this video of, or this documentary of uh, their own like history. And then it gets their comments and talks about their own personal reactions. And so you get kind of a step back. It's like, these are the people whose history is this war and how it has left them and affected their community. Anyway, I've got a couple more videos on here. Um, another PowerPoint. These are uh, the different, I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, these are the different, sorry about that. Let me get back to this. Hold on just a sec. Okay, so that's the example of voice thread. Um, as you can see, uh, students are asked to comment, to connect, to reflect, to react. Um, but basically, their participation is the important part. It's not about um, all of the literacy strategies or um, other deep thinking skills. It's can you view these, can you interact with these, and grab that background information and make it part of what you know. So as far as accountability goes for students, um, most of the appetizers that I do, the background information, is participation based. And so if you do it, you get the points, you get the full points. Um, discussions, brainstorms, gallery walks, voice threads, journals, all of those can be participation based. So if you 
worked on them, you put in a good effort, you get the points. Um, you can also do comprehension checks for things that are done outside of class. Um, so if you don't actually see kids working on it and you want to make sure that they did it, you can do a little online quiz. Um, nothing big, three points here, three points there. Um, it shouldn't be a great effector. Um, the point of having uh, this background information is that students participate in these support activities and those activities prepare them for the more in-depth literacy-based activities that you do later on with your anchor texts and your supplementary texts. So it's not about doing um, the activities perfectly, it's about being exposed to all of this information. I've got some resources on slides. So when you go to the website and download the PowerPoint, you can get connections to these resources. Um, when you are looking for background information, there are some strategies that you can use. Um, you can use Google. Um, Google is fantastic, especially their advanced search um, for finding things. If you uh, search it with teaching resources or for teachers or teacher tools um, or unit plans along with it, then you get a little bit more of the educational stuff. Uh, YouTube is an excellent source for videos. Um, you can subscribe to YouTube channels that are teacher oriented. Um, I subscribe to several science channels and social studies channels. Um, I got some great channels for literature. Um, and they're all like made by teachers or made by uh, companies for teachers. And those are some great free resources. I also use Life Finders. Um, teachers put together compilations of resources in some really great places. Pinterest is another one. Um, but Live Finders has this great search feature that you can use. And then you get the actual websites where sources are. Um, and then free uh, teaching resources online from the government is another great place for free resources. Uh, this slide has some social studies resources for current events. Uh, Vocabulary has the Week in Wrap, which is excellent. Uh, CNN Student News has a 5 to 10 minute uh, daily student news report. And the New York Times has articles for students um, that are in the news now. Uh, for English language arts, Schmook is one of my very favorite sites. Uh, they do novels, short stories, and poetry. Um, and so you can use those. They also do uh, history and uh, science. So if you have something that's in one of those, Schmoop is good for that also. Uh, Bartleby.com is for online novels. I often use pieces of novels um, as supplementary text or as background information for other novels. So if I know everybody has already read something, um, which is kind of nice when you're in like a, a junior class, then you know every, all the freshmen have already read this. Uh, you can use it to activate that background information for something with a similar theme. And then finally, like I said, Pinterest has some great things. This is a great language arts um, resource page on Pinterest. For science, um, we've got three. Edutopia has a lot of great resources, and so I found this uh, blog that had 10 science resources on it. Couldn't pick just one, had to throw all 10 of them up there. Um, PBS Learning Media has great videos uh, sponsored by PBS. And then Science Netlinks has really good digital resources. If you're here for the Connected Educators Month badge, uh, the code is LION126, and you can go to this site and get your badge there for participating in the webinar. Thank you guys very much. I'm Kelly Stair, writer and teacher consultant uh, with AngryBunnyPublishing.com. If you like this presentation, you'll love my ebook, VoiceThread for Digital Education, um, which is available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other ebook retailers, also at Smashwords. Um, also look for QR Revolution, which is all about using QR codes in your classroom. It's coming November 25th of this year, and you can pre-order it for $2.99 at Smashwords. Be sure to join me every Tuesday and Thursday for more great teaching with technology. Thank you.